everybody, it's Meredith Miller with Inner Integration. Today, the topic I have for you is on the victim narcissist. I've been getting some, some requests for this lately, so I wanted to put this topic out there. And I also want to remind you about a video that I made about two years ago called When You're the Victim and When You're Not. I'm going to put the link in one of these corners. You'll see the little eye. You can click on that to get the link to the video. So why is this a complicated topic? Why are a lot of people asking about this? I think there's several reasons. One is sometimes it's difficult to know who the abuser is and who the victim is. Particularly, the more covert, the more sophisticated the abuser is. That makes things very complicated to see. Also, because of the cognitive bias that we all have. We all have a cognitive bias that shapes the way we perceive the world. So if you're looking through the lens of feminism, and I'm not saying anything is wrong with that, but hear me out, if you're looking through the lens of feminism, your cognitive bias is going to tell you to immediately believe the woman, which could be very dangerous because I have worked with several male clients who were falsely accused of sexual harass sexual assault, excuse me, of sexual assault, among other things, by predator females. So your cognitive bias could also really be distorting your perception of who the victim is and who the abuser is. Also, sometimes there's what I call a switch dynamic. This is a term I'm borrowing from the BDSM terminology where they describe typically one person is more dominant, the other person is more submissive. And in a small percent of cases, they have a switch dynamic where they like to switch between dominant and submissive. In this case, bringing that term switch into the narcissistic abuse realm, what I'm talking about is two cluster B personality disordered people together. And that is the most volatile relationship of all. This could be a combination of a sociopath and a narcissist, of a narcissist and a narcissist. Maybe one's more overt, maybe one's more covert. Maybe they're both the same, they're both covert or they're both overt. Also it could be a psychopath and a borderline. So it could be a combination, a narcissist and a histrionic. So when these two are together, which does happen sometimes, it's not always that a narcissist and an empath, a narcissist and a codependent get together. So that's another caution and another complication too of why sometimes it's not so clear who's the victim and who's the abuser. And also, and perhaps the biggest reason of all, is sometimes the abusers play the victim. Quite often they will do this when you call them out on something. So this can be really confusing for the victim. It can also be confusing for the outsiders who are looking in and who are hearing the smear campaign or hearing the abuser's story and they're not really sure who the victim is and who the abuser is. But even you as the target could have been confused at time when that person was playing the victim. So why do manipulators play the victim? I have five reasons here for you. Maybe I'll leave some out, and if that's the case, be sure to write them below in the comments. So the first one is they like to use the pity ploy, which is coming in and pulling on the heartstrings of your empathy, which softens you up and allows you to open yourself and kind of feel this empathy or sympathy or even pity for this person. So often what I'll hear from clients is, they kind of doubt that the person is a narcissist or a psychopath or a sociopath, whatever. They're caught in the cognitive dissonance. They're caught in there because they're thinking, wow, you know, I heard all, all these stories about the ex or about their childhood, like what they went through with their mother or their father or some other outsider who abused them or maybe they were neglected by their parents. So that's not a past. Remember that most of us were abused as children. That does not give anybody the right to grow up and abuse other people and justify it based on what happened in their childhood. So that's one of the things that they're gonna do to kind of soften you up uh, to feel bad for them and also because that gives you this false perception of feeling safe. You know, if you feel like, oh, this person's a really good person, this bad thing happened to them, then you might not understand that this is a very unsafe person to be around. The second reason they play poor me 
is they're trying to extract narcissistic supply. So they're going to use all kinds of gaslighting maneuvers to somehow at the end of that conversation when you're talking about how you feel hurt and how what they did was really hurtful to you, but somehow by the end of that conversation, you're apologizing to them, right? How messed up is that? Because they're extracting narcissistic supply from you. Number three is because they need to manage their image. They need to manage their public image. So they want to look good. They want you to look bad. Number four is they want to get something from you. This comes from their sense of entitlement. They feel entitled to your time, energy, money, or other resources. And number five, they do it because they want to transfer the burden of their self-responsibility onto you or the target. So that's a classic maneuver for them to shift that responsibility to someone else instead of owning the responsibility of their behavior. So how do you tell who the real victim is and who is playing the victim? The first way is to look for their hypocrisy of demands versus actions. So maybe they ignore you when you try to contact them and then they flip it around and blame you for ignoring them because you stopped trying to contact them because they were ignoring you. Or maybe they told you, I'm really busy, uh, I don't have time to talk or, or text today. And then later on, and so you don't talk or you know, call them or text them, and then later on they blame you. Why don't you care about me? Why aren't you calling and texting? Or maybe they simply, they simply didn't answer, they didn't respond for a period of time, and then you stop texting or calling, obviously because they're not returning that, and then later they blame you for not caring, for not reaching out to them. Maybe they tell you, I don't want to do anything for my birthday, I just heard one of my clients tell me this the other day, this is her mother, I don't want to do anything for my birthday, and you're like, okay, and then you text them or call them on their birthday, and then the day after, the week after, the month after, the year after, they turn it around and blame you for not reading their mind and not realizing that no meant yes, and that they actually wanted you to be insisting on taking them out or doing something for their birthday. That is crazy making. Another way is to look for shaming and guilt tripping. A little while ago, someone left a comment in one of my YouTube videos shaming me about charging for my services. Like of all the free content that I put out there and all of my time that I give for free, not enough. The person was shaming me and telling me that real healers don't charge for their work. But it's like, baby, I don't know what planet you're living on, but here on planet Earth, we need to earn a living. You know, it's not like other people are just going to support us. And his insistence was that I go get some kind of other kind of job and continue to do all of this and more for free. And think about it, if I had some kind of job like that that was sucking away all of my time and energy, do you think I would be here giving away my time and energy for free? So when you hear that kind of thing, that's a person who's playing the victim to try to extract something from you. That also comes from a sense of entitlement. Looking for entitlement is another important way to discover who's the victim and who's playing the victim because the person playing the victim is going to have a sense of entitlement for your time, your money, your energy, your resources in some way, shape, or form. Another way is to look for the love bombing before the guilt tripping comes on. So maybe this person tells you, you're the only person who is blah, blah, blah. You're the only person who can blah, blah, blah for me. Making you feel special and also setting you up to start to feel responsible for them. Or maybe they tell you, you're so amazing and compassionate, but that's just a setup for when their demand comes for your time, your energy, your money, you're rescuing them in some way, shape, or form, and you say no, and then they blame you, and then they take that all away, and so if you don't say yes, then you're no longer compassionate or amazing. Another thing to look for is exaggeration. Maybe the person tells you, I was dying when you stopped talking to me for no reason. Um, but you stopped talking to them, which was actually called no contact, and there actually was a reason. The person just didn't like your reason or didn't see your reason because all they saw was what they wanted, which is for you to rescue them. So they over-exaggerated that they were dying when they weren't in fact dying at all. 
Look for a lack of self-responsibility. The person playing the victim will expect you to rescue them from their life, from their problems, and quite often from the problem of homelessness. And that's where you'll often find the person who has that parasitic kind of lifestyle where they go from host to host to host. Maybe it's like girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend or boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend. And they're just sucking away at all of their resources because poor them, they just can't. Keep in mind, the switch dynamic happens, and it could be that both partners are playing the victim. Also, when you don't do what they want, they're trying to blackmail you with guilt tripping or shaming or entitlement or something, when you don't do what they want, they're going to blame shift to you that somehow you're wrong or bad or cruel for not doing what they want you to do, and then they start the smear campaign. That's the person playing the victim. And finally, look for patterns. Okay, this is when I talk about being careful not to fall into the trap and learning responding versus reacting. So it could be that the actual abuser, the actual manipulator provokes you and provokes you until you react and then you react in front of people and then everybody looks at you like, oh my God. Or maybe something had happened behind the scenes that nobody at that table or that group or that event or whatever knew about. All they saw was your reaction it seemed so totally out of place that then they look at you and wonder, hmm, what's going on with you? So, you know, and also keep in mind, sometimes people have a really bad day. Maybe they were really stressed about something. They said or did something they regretted, but then they took it back later. They apologized later. So keep in mind that things can happen like that. But what you're looking for is a pattern of behavior. This person consistently behaves in the same way. And when you bring it up, they're going to blame shift. They're going to deny self-responsibility. They're not going to own it. And they're going to try to make it your problem. That's how you can always figure out who's playing the victim. Now I want to remind you that there's a difference between playing the victim and the victim stage of recovery, which is stage one of the CPTSD recovery. There's no shame in being the victim, in actually being the victim, but in that stage, you're in the powerlessness, the helplessness, the hopelessness, and you're trying to make that leap from the victim stage into the survivor stage. And so that leap takes place when you grab the reins of your destiny in your hands and you empower yourself and you realize you're no longer anyone's victim. You realize you have self-responsibility now. It doesn't mean the abuse was your fault. The abuse was not your fault, but it is your responsibility now to take ownership of your life and to heal yourself so that you can move forward and make that jump from that across that first threshold into the second stage and into the survivor stage. You'll find more information about this and how to help yourself get over that first threshold in my book, The Journey. So how do you know that you're still stuck in that victim stage? Again, I'm not saying playing the victim. I'm saying actually being in the victim stage. That's when you're going to notice the thought patterns that you have. And it's all about the abuser. It's the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist, or whatever name or label you're putting on that person. And that's all you can focus on. Focus on. And maybe you're stuck there for many months. I was there for years not realizing that there was something in me that I needed to shift, something in me that I needed to heal so that I can stop attracting more of those abusers, stop getting sucked into them when they showed up more and more covert along the way, and stop what's called the repetition compulsion, where it's the same pattern over and over again, just a different face. Remember, educating yourself about the narcissist, the sociopath, etc., and narcissistic abuse is an important part of the early stages of the self-healing process. You just don't want to get stuck there. Another thing I want to mention, which I also mentioned in my book, The Journey, is called the rescue fantasy that many of us had. This, I believe, is part of the complex PTSD where it's like you're in that powerlessness, the hopelessness, the helplessness of the victim stage, and you're just praying for someone to come in and rescue you from your life. Now that is different from the person playing the victim 
who is expecting others to rescue them from their lives because they will manipulate others into rescuing them from their life. And then if the people don't rescue them from their life, that's when they're going to lash out, blame shift to them, go on the smear campaign, do all sorts of other things. And be careful because that the rescue fantasy that comes with the complex PTSD can lead to you attracting abusers who are pretending to be saviors. They're pretending to come in to help you with whatever it is that you need. So in order to have a healthy relationship, you want to work on yourself and make sure that you are meeting all of your needs so that when you meet a new person, when you choose to enter a new relationship, you're going to enter that relationship based on wanting to be with that person, wanting to experience the growth that a relationship will bring into your life versus a point of neediness where you need that person and you become dependent on that person because that is a setup for getting trapped in an abusive situation. My high school boyfriend's mother told me, she's great advice sometimes, she's like, look, whether you end up marrying my son or not, you should always keep your own separate bank account. You know, you can have a joint account with which you guys are paying common bills together, but you should keep your money separate. And I highly recommend that. I've never forgotten those words. And thank God I never merged my finances with anyone, even when I was married. I kept my finances separate. I highly recommend that you keep your finances separate, even if you get married. You know, get a joint account for those joint expenses, but keeping your money separate means that you always have some escape plan just in case things go south. So that's what I have for you guys today on this topic. If there's something else I left out, some other questions you have, or some ways that you notice this happening in your life with the people, the manipulators and abusers who are playing the victim, I'd love to hear in the comments below. I'm sending you all a big hug.